We turn now to Yemen, where U.N. brokered peace talks in the country's nine-month-old civil war are faltering amid disputes between rival factions over the release of prisoners. Meanwhile, local officials have reported intensifying clashes and renewed airstrikes despite an ongoing ceasefire. Over the weekend, airstrikes by the, uh, uh, by the Saudi-led coalition that's backed by the U.S. killed 19 Yemeni civilians in their homes and at a market. About half of the nearly 6,000 people killed in Yemen's con conflict are civilians, including more than 600 children. Rima Kamal of the International Committee for the Red Cross in Yemen warned of a deepening humanitarian crisis. The overall humanitarian situation in Yemen is nothing short of catastrophic. On average, you have 25 people killed in Yemen every day, another 125 that are injured. This has been ongoing for more than eight months by now. The civilian population is suffering on multiple fronts. You have ongoing airstrikes, you have heavy ground fighting, and then you have, on top of that, restrictions on the movement of goods and services. The United States has bolstered the Saudi-led coalition's airstrikes in Yemen through arms sales and direct military support. Saudi Arabia is one of the U.S. arms industry's biggest customers. Last month, the State Department approved a billion-dollar deal to restock Saudi Arabia's Air Force arsenal, which was depleted by its bombing campaign in Yemen. The sale included thousands of air-to-ground munitions and general-purpose bombs. The U.S. and other countries have also reportedly sold internationally banned cluster munitions to Saudi Arabia that are now being used in Yemen. For more, we're joined by Sharif Abdelkadus, who's just returned from Yemen. He's a Democracy Now! correspondent, a fellow at the Nation Institute, and he's recently written a piece for The Global Post called, With U.S. Help, Saudi Arabia is Obliterating Yemen. It's the first of a two-part series on Yemen. Sharif, start off by just explaining what you found in your weeks-long trip there. Well, I spent most of the time in the Houthi-controlled north of Yemen, and this is an area that's been pounded uh, relentlessly for the past nine months uh, with near-daily airstrikes. Uh, you can't visit a city or a town in Yemen without seeing the destruction on the ground. Uh, everything has been hit, from um, homes to schools, restaurants, bridges, roads, a lot of civilian infrastructure. And, uh, and with that, of course, comes a lot of the suffering. Um, you know, all parties in this conflict have committed, uh, uh, are guilty of, of killing civilians. And the Houthi rebels and their allies are implicated in the deaths of hundreds of civilians, mostly by indiscriminate shelling, uh, using landmines, uh, snipers, and so forth. But according to the United Nations itself, the, the majority of civilians killed in this conflict uh, have died as, as a result of airstrikes. Uh, a, a study in September found that 60 percent uh, have died from these, from these bombardments. Uh, one of the cases that I looked at was uh, the bombing of a wedding in um, an area called Sanaban, which is a village just south of the capital. Uh, this was October 7th, and three brothers were getting married uh, from the same village on the same night. And they, uh, you know, when the wedding was at its peak, uh, you know, the brides had just arrived in a large convoy. Uh, most of the women and children were inside the house. Uh, and the men were outside in these tents erected outside. The missile smashed into the house, uh, destroying about half of it and setting most of the rest of it on fire. Uh, women were jumping out of the, of the building. And uh, 43 people were killed in the attack, including 16 children. Uh, I spoke to the, one of the surviving grooms, um, Ayman Asanabeni, and he, uh, you know, he could—he he, he was hardly even able to fathom what had happened to him. Uh, his uh, bride had died, uh, 18 years old, his mother, his father, his younger sister, and uh, his younger brother, uh, another one of the grooms. Um, you know, and many people were injured in the attack, very badly burned. One of them is named Abdullah Senabeni. He's a child prodigy who won, in 2012, a competition uh, and a visit to NASA and gave a TED talk. He now lies in a hospital in Boston. His right arm has been amputated above the elbow, um, and two of his toes have been removed. So this is just one of many cases uh, that you see across Yemen, and it's happening uh, while much of the world is really looking the other way. No one really is paying attention to Yemen. Uh, it doesn't get much attention in the media. And uh, people, when you talk to them, they say, why has the world forsaken us? And, uh, Sharif, uh, what about this Saudi-led coalition? Uh, who's in it and, and, and what level of the bombing? Are we talking here on a daily basis that the bombings are occurring? 
Yeah, I would say, that, uh, I mean, it's very hard to get an accurate count, but certainly almost every single day bombs are raining down from across, uh, across Yemen. Uh, apart from sporadic uh, drone strikes by the U.S., Saudi Arabia and the coalition is the only air power uh, above Yemen. Um, uh, this is a coalition made up of uh, mostly Gulf countries, uh, led by Saudi Arabia. The United Arab Emirates is also very heavily involved. And um, they have been bombing since March 26th uh, on Yemen. What I think people uh, uh, also need to understand is the level of U.S. complicity in, uh, in this war. So, as you mentioned at the top, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is the most avid customer of U.S. weapons and has bought uh, to the tune of $90 billion over the past five years uh, U.S. arms. What I think many people don't realize is that the United States is also providing crucial intelligence, logistics, targeting assistance, support to uh, the Saudi coalition, provides vital uh, aerial refueling uh, almost every day with two sorties uh, from tankers almost every day. And there's something called the Joint Combined Planning Cell, which is based in Riyadh. This was approved by President Obama, where you have U.S. military personnel meeting on a daily basis with Saudi military leadership, helping to coordinate uh, this war. And so human rights uh, workers that I talked to said that, uh, you know, the United States is not just a backer of this war, but they are a party to this armed conflict. And that's what people have to understand, is that, uh, that the United States government is complicit in what is happening in Yemen. And in essence, that Yemen has become another uh, growth market for the American arms industry, right? Because the more bombs and, and more missiles that are dropped, the more that have to be sold uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, to the, replace them. This $1.29 billion deal that was uh, just approved by the State Department last month is to replenish these laser-guided munitions, these smart bombs, so-called smart bombs. Uh, and so uh, this These is are some of the largest U.S. military deals in history. Right. And this With is Saudi the, uh, you know, Yemen is by far the poorest country in the region and it's being bombed by the richest. Last week, a journalist asked State Department spokesperson John Kirby if the U.S. will support the Yemen ceasefire. Yeah. I have a last question on Yemen. Yemen's uh, president, uh, Hadi, has asked the Saudi Arabia led coalition uh, to begin a seven day uh, ceasefire. Uh, Starting December 15, you are a part of the coalition. Will you support uh, this? Uh, we welcome the we, we welcome the reports of this uh, of this proposal, um, uh, and obviously we have to we have to see how this plays out. But we welcome the reports of the proposal. That was John Kirby, State Department spokesperson. Sharif. Well, you know, as you, as you heard, a very tepid uh, response, and and the U.S. repeatedly says, you know, we call on Saudi Arabia to investigate. Uh, any airstrike where civilians have died, but there's been no investigations done uh, so far. And, uh, you know, a lot of—another case that I looked at was also the bombing of a hospital. And this has happened many times uh, in Yemen. 600 hospitals have—or health facilities have been forced to close from uh, either being hit or from lack of supplies and fuel. Uh, but this was a hospital in Haidan, which is a northern uh, town near the Saudi border. Uh, it was supported by Doctors Without Borders, the international uh, medical organization. Uh, they regularly provided the GPS coordinates to the Saudi coalition. Uh, the MSF logo was on the roof of the building. Uh, and in late October, um, and Haidan is as a town that's been really devastated. I mean, uh, everything has been destroyed in the town. Schools, a uh, water project, uh, the main road is completely rubble. So this is the one place of sanctuary for people. Uh, and it was hit at night uh, while doctors were uh, sleeping in the back or sitting down for dinner. Uh, luckily, no one was killed in the attack. But um, the place has been completely destroyed, and this will definitely have fatal consequences. It served over 200,000 people in a very remote area. Uh, and now people, uh, doctors there who worked there, said that people will die because of lack of access to health care. And, Sharif, what's the potential here for any kind of a political settlement? I mean, there's a ceasefire that's been announced uh, right. uh, between the, the warring the factions uh, in the civil war. I mean, it's very tenuous. Uh, the stated goal of the Saudi coalition is to reinstate uh, the what they say the legitimate president Hedi. He has very, very little support on the ground in Yemen, and, and I think most observers would agree this is an unrealistic uh, goal to achieve. Uh, one of the problems is the array of groups, different groups that are fighting now uh, each other in Yemen. They're not all represented at these talks. Uh, you have uh, Salafi groups that are fighting. You have southern secessionist groups. Uh, and they're not—they uh, don't all have the same goals and the same grievances. And so, 
uh, really what's what's been happening in Yemen for the past year is threatening to really tear the country completely apart and bring it to a state where so it's more like, it's more it's more like Libya right now right, than... countries like Libya and Syria which have completely fallen apart and uh, Yemen is right there on the brink of that and part of the problem also is a, is a massive massive humanitarian crisis uh, as I said Yemen is the poorest country in the region uh, this was a place where people were struggling to survive before the conflict. It imports 90 percent of its food um, and, and fuel. And now 21 million people are in need of humanitarian aid. I mean, if you think about that number, that's more than double or just under double the number of people who need aid in Syria. Um, uh, you have uh, just skyrocketing, skyrocketing levels of malnutrition. Uh, Three million people have been added to uh, the, the ranks of the, of the hungry. Uh, and there's been uh, millions of people d displaced as well. I went to one camp where, uh, you know, people were living on this sun-washed hill on, this, on these rocks in these tents. Uh, they had no money even to buy wood to make fire to bake their bread. And so the children would go out and scavenge for plastic bottles, and they would pile them in the camp, and they'd burn the plastic bottles to make the fire to make this bread, and this toxic ooze would sludge out the bottom. And I, I said, don't you know, this is very bad for you? And he said, yes, but otherwise we'll starve. So this is the only way we can eat. Many of them are surviving on, on just bread and tea. They beg uh, in the streets. Uh, so it's a very, very dire situation. And the most basic of, of needs in Yemen are not there. Food, water, shelter, health care. Um, there's hardly any electricity anywhere. Uh, so at night, it's it's like going back in time. You know, you, you're wading through darkness mostly uh, in Yemen. People walking with flashlights and, and headlamps. Um, it's becoming one of the greener places because people are those who can afford it are buying solar panels. Yemenis are becoming experts in wattage and knowing how to store battery and, and things like that. But. Uh, it's a very dire situation. Like I said, it's not getting the kind of attention that it, that it needs. I want to go back to Saudi Arabia's role. The foreign minister, Adel al-Jubair, speaking on CBS News in September, was asked about the efficacy and accuracy of Saudi airstrikes in Yemen. We are very careful in picking targets. We have uh, very precise weapons. We work with our allies, including the United States, on, uh, on these targets. We do damage assessments of these targets after they're hit. So that was the Saudi foreign minister. We are very careful in our targets, Shreef Abokadus. Well, uh, he should uh, then answer for the thousands of civilians that have been killed by his bombs, by the bombs that are coming down. I mean, uh, it's, it's shocking that there isn't enough, uh, that the U.S. is not putting more pressure, that the United States is not doing its own investigations, given its conduct in the war. And, I mean, when I was talking about the humanitarian situation, Saudi Arabia and the coalition have imposed a blockade, a siege on Yemen, uh, this country that is in desperate need for its basic goods. Uh, this comes under the rubric of a Security Council resolution to uh, an arms embargo on the Houthi leadership. But, for example, in September, 1 percent of Yemen's fuel needs entered the country. Fuel affects everything, uh, access for food delivery, uh, f uh, electricity. Uh, so Yemenis are slowly being strangled to death. And there's, there's also both sides are using aid as a weapon. So uh, in, in Ta'iz, which is a, a, a city, that, so Yemen's third largest city, it's under siege by the Houthis, uh, who are waging a ground battle there. Uh, they have really blocked it off to the extent that people, individuals walking in, carrying a bag of groceries, they take the groceries away from them. They take, if they're found to be carrying any medicine or anything like that. Uh, so both sides are complicit here in Yemeni civilians. Are suffering. And, and I wanted to ask you, uh, the, what's the uh, attitude of the Egyptian government to all of this? I mean, being, Egypt still being the largest country in the Arab world uh, to, this, to this conflict, uh, not very far from their, from their borders. Well, Egypt is a part of this coalition. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, the government of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is very close to the Saudi Arabian government, which has provided and helped prop up his government with billions of dollars uh, in aid. And so, uh, you know, their policy very closely mirrors Saudi Arabia's. It hasn't been uh, sent any troops directly on the ground, but they, but they are part of the coalition. Meanwhile, this Committee for Protection of Journalists said that Egypt has now become the second deadliest place for journalists in the world. Cairo is Not where deadliest, you live. Most sure. dangerous. Most dangerous. Uh, so it's the second worst jailer of journalists in the world after China. Uh, it's probably the, the 
most rapid deterioration in press freedom uh, in the world. So there's 23, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, reporters who are behind bars. Among them is Mahmoud Abu Zaid, a uh, photojournalist known as Shao Ken, who uh, has, uh, was held for over two years without seeing a judge. Uh, which violates even Egypt's own penal code. Uh, you have another journalist called Ismail Iskandarani, who just arrived back. He was he knew that he Ten was seconds. in danger if he was going to go back to uh, Egypt, but he had to see his sick mother. He was taken at the airport and is, is in prison now. So this is the situation that we're living in. Well, Sharif, I want you to be very careful when you go back home to Cairo. Sharif Abdel Kudus, uh, Democracy Now! correspondent, fellow at The Nation. His recent piece is for The Global Post, and we'll link to it. It's called, With U.S. Help, Saudi Arabia is Obliterating Yemen. It's first of a two-part series on Yemen. And that does it for our broadcast. Happy birthday to Renee Feltz. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez for another edition of Democracy Now! Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. I want to thank you for tuning in to Democracy Now! We are so grateful to our fans and followers for being a part of the daily conversation. By choosing a news source that's committed to the truth, you're carrying the message of independent media, reaching hundreds of thousands of people every day. In these times of war and elections, we need a media not sponsored by corporations that profit from war, but a media that's truly independent, funded by you. Democracy Now! is not paid for by the weapons manufacturers, the insurance industry, or the oil, gas, coal, or nuclear companies. We don't take advertising or corporate underwriting dollars. That means we rely on your donations to make our daily independent news hour possible. We need your support today to keep bringing you the hard-hitting, in-depth reporting you've come to expect five days a week. Visit democracynow.org, or you can call 888-999-3877. That's 888-999-3877 to make your holiday gift to Democracy Now! today. Thanks so much for sharing Democracy Now! stories all year long.